Okay, so for this week of Integral Dharma, we are exploring the last of the four ups, showing up. So we had uh, waking up, cleaning up, growing up, and now showing up. So I want to talk about, uh, yep, generally just what is it and compare it also with the other four ups to help differentiate it, even though, you know, these categories of practice tend to overlap uh, in, in many ways and intertwine. And then explore what practice might look like in showing up. First, you know, what's the motivation for showing up? I feel like um, the other three ups, maybe motivation is a little clear sometimes, but, um, and also with showing up, this category sounds, I think, really, maybe it sounds obvious too. So like, it's just like you hear the word showing up and in English anyways, that, that word, that phrase kind of says, yeah, show up. And maybe we have an intuitive sense of what that means. Um, but here for the motivation, uh, for me, the, the phrase uh, that I use a lot, especially with the fourth turning of Buddhism and integral Dharma is what's happening here matters. So it's the simplest. So that's why we're showing up. That's why we're doing this practice because what's happening here in our lives in the world matters. And as far as what would be motivating us and the flavor of motivating us could take so many different forms, okay? Um, we could say simply like, you know, love, joy, and suffering. These are classic motivators for us to show up in the world. In particular, in the context of the world right now, and for many of us, my sense in, in this training and all my groups, um, <clears throat> you know, the flavor of uncertainty, stress, anxiety, despair, these things are, have been more prominent uh, in our awareness for, and for the motivation for showing up. So I have a few quotes here that kind of relate to that. Uh, these first two are from Dongshan's five ranks. It's the commentary from Ross Belletter, uh, definitely one of my favorites. Uh, so it says, there is no place where we are safe from the unanswerable pain of the world. It breaks in everywhere. Even if we flee from suffering, barricading ourselves in, we find that we're not high and dry at all. And we suffer needlessly through our avoidance, holding back as suffering. The place of avoidance is fraught and lonely, but whether we hide or whether we front up, the suffering of the world persists. We can never eliminate it. It is better to stay put for then at least we may be able to contribute through our presence and actions if they are intelligent. So this is in the context of a waking up, you know, a book on waking up and it's uh, imploring us to show up and really some of the phrases like front up, um, holding back, contributing. These are all phrases that relate to what we mean when we talk about showing up. You also had one other short quote here. We don't know what will happen, yet we continue to plan. And it takes courage to imagine and plan for an unimaginable future to sink pylons for an imaginary bridge and airy nothingness. So again, we show up um, because what's happening here matters. And then one more quote here. This is from a sermon from Martin Luther King entitled Shattered Dreams. I hadn't read it before, but um, I look, uh, I saw that title the other day and I was like, oh, this feels relevant <laughs> these days. I'm like, there's gotta be something good in here. So he explores in this sermon, the ways in which we, you know, we get discouraged and, and don't show up, you know, the different flavors of that, whether it's cynicism or despair or resignation. And then in this quote, he says, uh, what then is the answer? The answer lies in our willingness, our willing acceptance of unwanted and unfortunate circumstances, even as we still cling to a radiant hope. Our acceptance of finite disappointment, even as we adhere to an infinite hope. We must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. Only in this way shall we live without the fatigue of bitterness and the drain of resentment. I very much love that quote in the context of the times we're in. So again, there's imploring for us to show up. And I love the phrase infinite hope and that distinction of finite disappointment. And so for me, uh, you know, one way that we can describe showing up is showing up as the enacting of infinite hope. It's acting from that place. Now to expand on what is showing up even more, just a note, you know, in Religion of Tomorrow, well, I don't know where that book is at, but you know, it's like that thick, right? Per, per usual for a Ken Wilber book. And in there, he mentions the phrase showing up like four times, maybe. 
and you can look in the index and those four times are just like a sentence or two. So there's not like an exposition on showing up, which is really fascinating to me. Um, partly, I think it's probably that way because it's sort of meant to be, you know, there's a presumption about it. Like, okay, you're going to get when I say showing up, this is, you get it. So I don't need to talk about it a lot, but also, you know, I, I've talked to other, you know, I was talking with Lisa, uh, who's also teaching, you know, the other group of integral Dharma and other, other friends who've been steeped in integral Dharma for a long time. And there's been ambiguity, like what the hell do you mean by showing up or, or, or ambiguity in the sense of like how to talk about it succinctly. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do today is give you some sense of that. Um, so phrases that come up for me too are embodiment, enactment, actions, work, service, impact on the world, relationships. These all feel really relevant. And I list these out because really depending, as we'll find out more here um, um, at the end of this talk, showing up could take a lot of different flavors, a lot of different motivating factors and forms. And so it's hard to put it into a single definition. So that's why I like to highlight words because maybe one of those phrases or words resonates with you most right now and elicits that showing up feeling. I like the word enact here. Um, it's a, uh, it means to put in, <clears throat> put into practice an idea. Okay, put into practice an idea, make something happen. Um, it also has the sense of act out on the stage which also has, it. so it's like the stage, what's the stage here? Life, the world, okay? It's also a, a what's known as a transitive verb for linguistic nerds, uh, which means uh, there's an agent of the verb and there's an object that receives the action of that verb. And that to me very much also describes showing up. It's, there is a sense of taking action and it having an impact. Okay, it's less of an intransitive verb like the other ups. Intransitive verbs don't have an object. It's just something that just happens. So, you know, when we talk about waking up and cleaning up and growing up, it's sort of like this thing that happens. We might say it happens to us, but it's still just something that just unfolds. Whereas showing up is much more a transitive verb. Now, um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this and comparing it, but one advice here, even though we're gonna talk about it, don't make it too philosophical abstract, okay? Because this is about action, about showing up, okay? Uh, so compared to last week when I said, hey, growing up, this is gonna be a sweaty talk and exploration. This is the opposite of that, or at least it should be. So in comparison, uh, comparing uh, this showing up to the other ups, uh, you might remember that I mentioned uh, phrases that Ken uses. So waking up into freedom, cleaning up, flourishing, growing up fullness, and then showing up full functioning. So already how different that word is compared to the other ones, full functioning. Another way that I laid this out, I already kind of did this a little bit with cleaning up and growing up is, is orienting it towards a sense of time. Um, waking up is timeless. Cleaning up is about the past coming into the present moment. Growing up is the unfolding into the future potential. And showing up is one of two things, just present moment. So not timeless present, like what's happening right now. Um, and the integration of the other three, timeless, past, future, all happening all at once in the world. So now a little bit more comparison to these, um, waking up and showing up. You know, the first quote I shared uh, from Dong Shan's ranks uh, already indicates that we can't, waking up just doesn't stop. It's like, we don't get to just rest on an insight or realization, the suffering world persists. And so we need to show up and contribute and we'll feel that suffering. There's nowhere, nowhere we can run that we will lose touch with that because we're a part of this world. That's the interdependent origination piece. We don't exist isolated in the world. And even within, for example, the Buddhist path, if you look at different lists, you know, or like the path unfolding, where does it end up? Ends up with vows, right? The Bodhisattva vow, and that's showing up to, to help all beings to also awaken. Um, we talk about enlightened activity. That's a phrase that is used. What does it mean to be active as an awakened person? Um, talk about... Um, uh, yeah, behavior too. Um, also things like right livelihood. Okay, so there's a lot of talk of showing up even in a tradition of waking up, okay? Cleaning up, uh, 
as we talked before, we're reclaiming more of ourselves. Um, and when we do that, we have more to bring into the world into our showing up. And really, oftentimes, my experience is that the more showing up that happens, the more obvious uh, it is what needs to be cleaned up, right? When we're in relationships, when we're serving in the world, we start bumping up against shadows and difficulties. And, and then growing up and showing up, uh, growing up gives us more capacity to show up in the world, okay? And one thing that's important here, remember last time we mentioned this group that um, we have to be mindful of, of how our growing up, how our own structures of mind might color what we consider showing up to be. So, and still in this, in our, I think, you know, at least in the United States and in the West personal development, that category of books in a bookstore is the flavor that probably most comes to mind when we think about showing up, we think of personal development and coaching in that realm. And that's, that's included in there. But also, I think a lot of that's associated with Robert Keegan's self-authoring mind. I'm the author of my life. I'm not merely beholden to, to sociocentric uh, norms and limitations. I can also author my own life. And um, but, you know, he, there's a next order of consciousness that's self-transforming that realizes even the authoring itself is happening because we're a part of so many systems and networks and relationships that it's not just me holding a pencil, writing my life. <laughs> and so what then does showing up look like from these different developmental levels like we did last time? So that's something we can explore as well. Um, and last of these ups, just because we've realized something internally does not necessarily mean that there's a corresponding impact in our showing up. Likely there's going to be something that changes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, all of a sudden we're going to realize and enact in the world what, what is needed. We still have to apply some effort. We can't just say, well, I'm going to wake up and then it's all good. I'm going to clean up, then it's all fine. If I grow up, then perfect. I have the capacity and everything will happen on its own. So um, basically showing up as limited or enabled by the degree to which we've woken up, cleaned up and grown up. And there's a, another a verb, this is from Spanish that I like that kind of embodies that. It's not a word that's used a lot in Spanish, but it's a posibilitar and it's really similar to the word possible, but we don't have that as a verb, like it'd be possibilitate or something <laughs> in English. Um, but it, it means to make something possible, you know, and it's a transitive verb as well. So that's what those other ups are to me. They, they bring that possibility into the showing up. Okay, so um, we can ask the question for showing up as a practice, what needs our attention? What needs um, our response? Now, Ken, the one thing that he will gravitate towards um, in terms of showing up is looking at the quadrants. I'm not gonna unpack the four quadrants in detail here. You can check out my introduction to interval theory that does that. Um, but I will, I do want to talk about this. So these four quadrants real quick, we have um, the upper left quadrant is the interiors of, of individuals. So when we experience like mm, thoughts and, and feelings and states of experience, that's that quadrant. The exterior is the upper right quadrant. And that is like our, our brain, observing our brain waves and things like that, that correspond to thoughts. Lower left is the interiors of, of, uh, of the we, of collective language, shared values, things like that. And then lower right is the exterior of the collective that we can observe, um, you know, like healthcare systems and the economy. We can kind of note these things with numbers and just observe them, okay? And um, one way to look at this, just to give a more practical example is like through the pandemic. And the reason why we're doing this is because when you take these quadrants, you can apply them to your life in any situation. It's going to help you to examine what might need your attention and where you might tend to gravitate towards and what might you leave out that needs some showing up. Now with the pandemic, just a really quick four quadrant analysis, just to give you a taste of it. In the upper left, internal experiences, we might experience fear, stress, anger, confusion, hope. These are internal experiences 
in terms of response to the, the pandemic. Now, um, upper right is the biological reality, symptoms and effect, effects of the virus, pretty simple. Lower left is the culture, the language, how we talk about it. For example, um, you know, the, we can take like the use of mask as an example. Now it has an exterior reality in terms of science of like, what does it do? The function of protecting us, but there's an in, interior we, there's very much some different we's playing out in, in, you know, in the United States about people who want to wear a mask. I wear my mask. I think it's very necessary. Um, and then there's people we've seen who like think it's a violation of personal freedom, right? That's an interior experience that then affects other quadrants. Um, the lower right is simple as like, again, a healthcare system, the impact on economy, the measures that we take to, you know, objectively, um, factual language about, about the systemic effect of it. So because this is so up for us, we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic and the coronavirus, I thought that'd be a good example to apply it to. Now you can come that you can identify so much more than what I did there, um, and apply that, uh, in much more detail, but, um, uh, basically you can apply this to your life in general or any situation. And that's one example, you know, you can kind of just apply one quadrant at a time and see what comes up for you as a response of what's needed. Now I'm um, talking about some other practices here. Um, just put yourself in situations that require you to show up. That's the simplest one. And we're all probably, we're already all in situations that are doing that automatically. So relationships, family, work, service, community, um, by putting ourselves in these situations that require us to show up regularly, we can, I mean, just as long as we're paying attention, we'll be able to see what practices we need to support us to show up more in those situations. Okay, so that's a feedback loop there. Um, apply the four quadrant awareness, that's one. Uh, and then today we're gonna work with another one, um, embodied inquiry and the question, what is needed? So um, we do the embodiment, we inhabit the body to first disarm the conceptual mind or disarm the us condensing into the conceptual mind. And this allows us to bring all of our being and all of our capacities into the inquiry. So it's a more full bodied, full being response to what is needed. It also brings us into an immediacy. So that way, when we ask the question, what is needed? there can be a fresh spontaneous response to what's happening. The idea is that we can get more directly, more intimate with our, with their experience. Okay. When we ask the question fresh and spontaneous like this, and hopefully not condensed with in the mind, but including the mind, um, we can have thoughts, feelings, sensations, imagery, anything can arise. It can make sense or not make sense immediately. And this to me is very important. If we, the more that we can get into this spontaneous presence and ask a question that matters, then what arises can be really useful. And we will probably have to investigate it further outside of the practice. But this is the initial, the, the, the first step to ask the question, see what arises and then follow through. Now, in terms of the following through, I could have also talked about any number of very tangible, helpful models and techniques around showing up, but I didn't want to limit the possibilities for each of you, for, for each of us, okay? But for example, possibilities, an action comes up. Maybe I need to do this. We need to do this, okay? Um, it's not necessarily that like, oh, a bunch of things are going to come up. Like, oh, I got a laundry list. That's what I should expect is a laundry list of actions to come up. Maybe, but maybe not. It could be a purpose or a role you need to embody or fulfill. Okay, and that's, that's, that's sort of an orientation in the world. So it's not necessarily next action, but from which we take actions, okay? Um, forming or deepening relationships. Maybe that's the response to cultivate uh, our relationships. It might be a clarification or pri prioritization of values. What's most important to me? Maybe I, that's what I need to spend time with. I'm kind of confused about what's the most important right now. I'm gonna go into a, a process of that, or maybe that get, I get clarity that, oh, here's what's most important right now. And then there's also strategy, which bridges purpose values and, and actions for long-term goals. So strategy is like uh, 
a, a plan of action, like how to go about enacting this. And it might be composed of, uh, of roles and relationships and, and actions. How do, what kind of strategy do I need to implement as a response? These are, uh, oh, also seeking support for your showing up. That could arise. So these are pretty big categories and pretty common for me uh, that what I've seen of, of arising to in response to what is needing and in showing up. It's not an exhaustive list, but you can see how each one of these could be very different in terms of then tangibly seeking um, practices and tools. They'd be very different depending on that. And I could give recommendations for all of these, um, but that's a whole, you know, it's multiple talks. <laughs> um, so that should hopefully get us oriented showing up and now we can practice. <laughs>